Oh, Valor Janssen. Halfordson. Oh, he just bullied two guys. This is brilliant. Oh, unbelievable goal. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Whoa, whoa. Hold on a second there, Buster. You might think you know everything. You're ready to go conquer the world. You know, I'm rooting for you. There's just a few things that I would like to tell you now that I've acquired this weird time machine called editing. This isn't real. It's not actually happening. I hope you know that. We made it up. We made this one up. It's a made-up tip. It's a total fabrication. Back in the olden days, when I started to stream Football Manager like every day, I didn't know a lot of things. I was good at the game, but in the sense that I played it in the back of all of my college lectures, not in the sense that I had a thousand of you over my shoulder on Twitch, which if you want to check that out, it's down in the description, critiquing everything that I do to help me get better. But years of doing that and learning and learning something new every day, uh, I've got a few tips that I would like to give myself back then that might have helped me actually win the Champions League playing out of Iceland instead of just getting to the, the round of 16. We never won it with our Icelandic brethren. I'll return to you one day. We'll win it together. Number one. Don't be afraid to split your lines. There is a thing that happened. Maybe it just happened to me, but it could be happening to you too. That probably the most important thing I would like older me to understand. Something I didn't adjust. And honestly, because it's in come around in the last couple of years of Football Manager, but four years I didn't change, is the distance between the lines. And so you start, obviously, on a tactic, you start with standard line, standard defensive line, right? And what I have hesitated to do in past years, up until I would say probably last year, is tweak how those lines are playing instead of just saying, well, we're going to be really high or, you know, I feel like we need to be a lower block today, but to actually tweak and say, no, we're going to go standard and a lower line of engagement or what I have going in my Oriental Dragon right now, which is a much higher line of engagement and just a higher defensive line, a little bit more taking the space away behind the defenders and forcing them to use that space in front of the back four and try and pass their way through, right? I cannot stress enough the tactical fluidity that you are able to open up if you start to tweak these lines. Let's watch how this plays. So with the super high line of engagement and the only high back line, what we're attempting to do is keep full pressure on their back line at all times while taking away a little more space off the back end than just an extremely high line would normally leave because we found that that extremely high line was opening up too many runs in behind us. Where you're vulnerable in this is teams being able to pass from back to front surpassing your midfield. I'm putting a lot of onus on my midfield to be able to defend and to be able to eat up space. But the advantages we get offensively here is as we start to advance this ball, you see the amount of pressure that we're keeping up against the back line the entire time. Armando Pereira, who's playing an advance forward in this case, even we have the ball all the way back here, even when they've got the ball all the way up here with Nick Giacchini, right? These guys, they're, they're way up there, right? Like they're nowhere near helping this out. The midfield's covering all of this space in the middle and my back line is still setting a pretty high precedent. Nice tackle by Jason Serna. And these guys are already up there to engage uh, in a little attacking. One wonderful pass, a nice touch, and a nice finish later, and it leads to a goal. Now, here's the next play. We're going to end up getting worked on this play, but this just shows you, like, where our line is coming to set itself. Uh, so we clear the ball and get rid of possession. Our line is going to come outside of the 18, but it's not going to go farther than that. So if the ball is played into this space, you're reasonably expecting my boy Bonga Kule Shabalala, great goalkeeper name, to be able to cover that. We're at least making it much more difficult for that ball to be played in. Now we're still going to get worked on this play, but I find that's really effective. So if you are giving away goals and, and you want to play the super high gig and press because everybody in your mother's telling you to play the super high gig and press, right? But you are giving away goals in this... <clears throat> It's not a half space. I was going to say this half space, but I can't fall into that trap. If you're giving away goals that are in this kind of space, when teams are in sustained possession, it's that ultra high line. I would recommend dropping it one. I'm going to do a more intense tactical breakdown about the way the different lines can be can be used, but you can use your imagination of what spaces you want to create and how you want to draw maybe the opposition defense forward with a lower line of engagement. It's neat and the sort of thing that I just didn't experiment with for years that can really free up a tactic or address a problem that can't be addressed any other way. Number two, potential 
is not always your friend. And for this, we're going to take a trip into the brutal U23s at Oriental Dragon to take a look at somebody named Tabani Lingwadi. So I'm looking at this guy, right? He's got a resolute personality. He's either footed. He's two star, three and a half to four and a half star. This guy, to me, is not as good as this guy. Why? Because the longer you play football manager, I think the more and more you get accustomed to the idea of what can you do for me now? Lamine Kemenani, for me, what I need and what he can do on the field is a better player than, well, I uh, really messed it up, it's unbelievable, than Tabani Lingwadi, who is an objectively worse player at basically, at, not basically, at everything. He's worse, except for footedness. He is either footed, so. And I have had Tabani Lingwadi for a few months now, we've not seen a giant explosion of development, which means I am not necessarily encouraged that this guy will ever be a first team player, even though if he hits that potential, he will be a first team player. Here's another example. We signed this guy. He was a five star potential player. Our team's gotten a lot better, but he was not good when we signed him at 19 years old, even though he had all that crazy potential. And if it was me a couple years ago, I would have signed him going, you know, Bjarki Thorarison is one for the future. Well, look at him now, right? He just hasn't gotten better. He didn't have the mentality. He wasn't able to get playing time anywhere significant, despite the fact that we've tried to give him every opportunity, right? Play in the fourth division, those sorts of things. I spend years trying to figure out how to get the best out of these young players. And a lot of the time, they'll still fall flat because they don't have the ability at the moment to be able to contribute anywhere that's going to help them to develop and their mentality sucks and it's over Lingwadi's mentality doesn't even suck he just sucks now, there's a really wonderful Arthur of Sepian right this guy who I I've been told I had this guy when he was what 18 this is amazing we signed him for free he joined us on a free he's an Armenian national team player look at him right He's not that good. I mean, at the level you're coaching at, maybe in football manager, he's good. But we keep, we begin, oh, look at his potential ability. It's incredible. His hidden attributes, incredible. Loves big matches, very consistent, right? And yeah, we loaned him out to the fourth division. He was the player of the year in the fourth division. But when you compare this guy to like Tabani Lingwadi, he is marginally better than Tabani Lingwadi. And then when you compare him to somebody who is like actually on my team named Angel Zamudio, it's an absolute no contest. And Zamudio is only considered a three-star player on the same scale. But if I was trusting my eyes of a couple years ago, I'd be like, yo, we need to get Hovsepian in. He's going to turn the corner. He's going to get there eventually. A lot of guys don't. And if, if they have a long way to go, you need to start seeing that improvement pretty quickly because it's the same as real life. That window slams shut pretty fast. And if you don't get better constantly, that window is going to stay shut. Hovsepian, he's never going to be good enough to be a first-team player for me even though my scouts insist that he will be. It's been five years. It's not there. Number three, split fees to avoid players. This is a transfer trick, and it's something that makes you super nervous at the time that you do it. But as you go through years of playing football manager, you get more comfortable with it. And that is when you go in to buy a player, you do not pay all of the money up front. Why would you do this? So that you can afford quality players that you know are gonna make a huge difference for your team. And then you set up the payout structure to pay out when you can afford it. Let's take a look at Jao Silva. This is a huge success story for me. This guy won the European Golden Boy Award at the age of 19. I mean, just look at this turnout after a $1.8 million transfer four years ago. But let's take a trip to 2026, 2027. In 2026, 2027, we've been a fully professional club for five years. We have no money. Our transfer budget is pushing a million. How do we afford a $1.8 million transfer for a 16 year old who can go on and be a star that leads our team in goals and assists last season? Well, we deferred it. We paid 600,000 up front, and then we split the other 1.2 million between 50 appearances, which is here. Let me show you. Let me pretend to make an offer for somebody. Go to my short list, some random dude, Ever Slamoka. Right, so we're going to make an offer for this guy. So the offer for Zhao Silva looks like 650000 right? And then we added an after 50 league appearances, which is always more than one season in the future, right? Even if they play every game, we had a cheeky 600000 And then we had bonus competition achievement, winning league and Oz. 600,000. This is essentially how that transfer looked. If we win Liganos, 
I'm not going to care about $600,000. What's going to be much more valuable to me is the fact that we got Zhao Silva on the team to help us win Liga Nas, right? Because this kid's 16 years old and already starting in the top flight. In the after 50 league appearances, I knew I would be able to afford. And you can always go to the transfer section and see if you have the opportunity to pay it off earlier if you happen upon some money from a player's sale or something. I knew if we sustained success, success, we were going into Europe next season, that if we sustained that kind of success, we were going to have the money to afford afford them, but in that moment, we didn't have it in the balance. So split up your transfers so that you can afford players and then pay it off when you know you're going to be able to afford it. We win Liga Nas, I'm going to have a lot more than $600,000 to help back pay the fact that we got Jao Silva on the team. Not to mention, we've gotten offers of upwards $60 million for the guy, so it ended up being worth it. You find somebody that's worth it, strike a deal like this. Defer your payments. Don't put it all on after league appearances, though. That it's, it's more of a confidence play if you know your team is coming into a lot more money in the near future. But that is the sort of thing that can bankrupt you. And you will get inbox messages reminding you like, hey, one more appearance, then just can it. If you can't afford the payment, right, stop playing the guy and sell them. And you should be able to at least get your money back if you're doing this with young players. Number four, when you're not healthy financially, don't pay for a youth team. Seriously, you don't need one. It's a myth. It's a fallacy. Like we like we talked about at the beginning of the video. It's an illusion. It's simply not true. It's wrong. Don't believe it. It's a lie. It's not true. Don't believe it. The fallacy. Don't sign any of your youth players if they're bad. Don't sign anybody to fill out your U23 team. When you're a poor team, you save a lot of money. You really don't lose out on anything. And then once you can afford it, obviously it's better to have your young players playing around actual human beings instead of grayed out aliens. But why was it so exhausting to stand up? I really should never do that again. Number five. Make shortlists. The number of amazing signings that I have been able to bag in the last two editions of Football Manager because I have made multiple shortlists, including actual targets, loans, which is my code name in this particular save for a list of uh, 419 players that I could potentially want to sign at some point. Uh, and end of contract players, which is a list of players whose contracts expiring in the next year and I might be interested in signing. I can either trial them or offer them prematurely and I'll get a nice little message in my inbox that says, uh, hey, you've got some shortlisted players whose contracts are running out. Would you like to make an offer on them? These amazing reminders have not only provided me every single player until I got into the top division of Portugal because I never bought a single player before that. That's a lie. I bought one and we bought him in January, the season we got promoted. So it's, and we only, it, okay, okay, okay. And we bought him, we signed him end of contract and then we paid the fee so he could join us in January instead of at the end of the season. You caught me and I'm guilty. But other than that, they were all into contract signings and they still pay dividends now on the like loan shortlist because I would just add people that were capable. You know, if I sold somebody, I would need to sign, let's say a new left back. Well, we sold Diego Castellanos, a world star left back, 30 caps for Colombia, at 21 years old, right? He gets sold by the board. We go fishing and we're like, well, there's this dude at Hajduk Split who's on our short list who looks like he's pretty capable. At a 7.4 and a 7.73 later, Christian Carbajal is kind of a legend for us uh, and ended up being a fabulous signing at $195,000. Not only did he replace Castellanos, he flat out outplayed him for two seasons. You thought I was kidding. You really thought I was kidding. He has higher ratings than Castellanos every year. He just gets better with age. He's like a fine wine. Not that I would know. And then to the last one, green isn't always good. And I'm not talking about money. I'm talking about players and particularly the addiction to when you look at a player and you see green going, wow, that's amazing. This guy's great. Because what did you notice when we looked at Arter Hovsepian? Arter Hovsepian has some green. But his green is in free kick taking, bravery and determination. A great player, this does not maketh. Now it's nice to have those things, but you need to be able to do some other things. And a player like Petr Todorov is also offering, you know, three or four greens, right? But he offers so much more in the positions that he can play. He's versatile, he plays defensive midfield to striker in the spine, he can play right wing as an inverted winger, right? He's got good tackling, he's got good passing and vision, makes good decisions, he works well, he's a decent athlete with incredible balance. I mean, this, is a great prospect and a great balanced player. 
and a player that has the same amount of green as Arthur Hevsepian. Do not be fooled by the color into thinking that all the color is made equal, because I would consider Petr Todorov a very similarly skilled player to Jason Serna. Not skilled, but a similar level of quality to Jason Serna, and so would my coaching staff by half a star, because Serna has the first touch long shots passing and technique, but there are some large gaps in his game. For one, Cerna's not quite as intelligent when it comes to making decisions on the ball, right? Not quite as grounded in terms of a player that can dictate the tempo. Oh yeah, he also cannot play defense to save his life and is not as good of a finisher anywhere near the goal. Now, Jason Cerner scores a couple bangers every year. He's an amazing shooter from outside the box, but having kind of different types of players and not just players that are whores for the green can be good. Don't fall in love with the green. I still do sometimes. I mean, I ended up with like four players that looked exactly like this and we had to sell one. I'll miss you, Jason Sweeney. I'll miss you every day. But Petr Todorov is better than this guy. And that's why he had to go. I'm gonna miss you, man. He's Irish too, dude. I'll see you on the stream for another video. I don't want to talk about it.